Joining us now on the Michigan Megacast is the Chief of Park, the Parks and Recreation Division at the Michigan Department of Health and, I'm sorry, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Ron Olson joins us now on the Michigan Megacast. Ron, thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Appreciate having you on. So uh, a lot's going on in, in our parks, especially in the last couple of years uh, as we have uh, kind of gone into a different phase or a couple different phases of the COVID-19 pandemic, people getting back out into the community, certainly back out into our parks and heaps and droves over the last uh, a couple of years in particular. And the parks are making improvements as well here in the state of Michigan using American Rescue uh, Plan funds or ARPA <laughs> funds to improve many of these different locations. Can you tell us about some of these improvements that are being made uh, at these parks and how long they've been necessary for? Well, we, uh, I started with the DNR in 2005 and we did began an assessment of what our infrastructure was and we did site inspections uh, throughout all the state parks at that particular time and we came up with a list of needs of nearing $300 million and that included everything from sewer systems, utilities, water, electric, roads and, um, and buildings and uh, bathrooms and shower buildings and in some environmental situations, historic preservation and uh, improvement of and protection of cultural resources and over time our financial circumstance improved and we were able to start working on uh, those plus we had secured grants and other funding but we still over time and fast forward up to the more recent time we still had uh, you know just below $300 million of things because as things get older, repairs and upgrades need to take place. So when um, the uh, recovery funds were made available by the federal government to each state, the governor had proposed out of the nearly $8 billion of allocated funds to the state, $250 million for to rehabilitate the state park system to do a big catch up uh, that uh, from that list, which has been well known for a long time, but this was an opportunity. So that all transpired, the legislature uh, um, very overwhelmingly approved of this and it became um, a reality earlier this year. And we're now are on the, in the process of launching uh, what we call a first phase of, sh of shovel ready projects that are projects that had already been designed that uh, we could put out to bid. And then another wave was projects that were, um, we had identified and were priorities, but they went out for design uh, and engineering work. So right now we have about $16 million worth of projects out in the marketplace to work on, but eventually we will uh, address everything on the list. But that's our first uh, shot in the, in the last few weeks. We got those out to bid. We're joined by Ron Olson, the Chief of Parks and Recreation for the Michigan Department of, of Natural Resources, or DNR. More information can be found on their website, michigan.gov slash DNR, michigan.gov slash DNR for more information uh, and updates along the way on some of these many improvements that are being made in park infrastructure projects. So uh, with, the, uh, with the initial influx of money that's being allocated to Michigan's parks, uh, through the, the state's ARPA funds. Where are those initial funds going? What specific projects are uh, the, is the DNR starting off with? Well, the, these happen to be ones that, like I said, were really already designed and ready to go to bid. And some of them didn't have funding, so they were sitting. One of them is um, at Fayette Historic State Park in the Upper Peninsula was to uh, work on some of the chronic needs of the historic town up there because we have some different things, including masonry walls and others that are in, in chronic need of restoration to keep the town center and his, his historic integrity there. We also have a, uh, at Strait State Park, we have $2 million worth of projects there. Uh, we have uh, two toilet shower buildings primarily that will be replaced or renovated uh, in the campground up there. 
We have Sheboygan State Park. We have uh, campground um, electrical systems, water distribution, and some sewer upgrades there as well. Bay City Recreation Area. Uh, the state park, I should say, as um, the visitor center, which is one of the most heavily used and visited ones by school groups and otherwise going through a modernization. That building is very old and needs to be more accessible and be brought up to modern times. And um, we have some work at Sterling State Park to commence some much needed eroded trails and pathways that go around the ponds there that were really impacted by high water situations. Um, and uh, Porcupine Mounds, we have a number of restoration projects there. And Belle Isle Park in Detroit, we have uh, a huge project there to work on the upper part of the uh, Anna Scripps uh, Whitcomb Conservatory, where that was built in the early 1900s and is in critical need of, of infrastructure repair to the integrity of the structure, the glass and everything to keep keep that going. So those are just some quick examples of, of things that we're doing. And so, Ron, how are these improvements, uh, how are these uh, infrastructure projects then going to trickle down to visitors of the parks, particularly Michiganders, but also those visiting the parks and improve the experience of visiting Michigan's vast and, and varying parks all across the state? Well, what we want to do, our goal is to create an atmosphere of a clean, safe, a functional park that's relevant to people's needs and everybody's needs and you know so people will see improvements uh and in the um, in the park areas and um, some of them will be very visible such as a uh we're working on uh some you know parking lots or roadways for example that people will see um, that'll be very visible some of them not so much water lines and sewer systems they may not see as much readily but certainly a bathroom or a shower building is a, something that people depend on and utilize uh, uh, every day or more than once a day when they're in a park camping or what have you. So there'll be a lot of things that people will see, but what we want are people to come and enjoy themselves and not have to uh, think about, well, something is not really up to snuff or the water's not flowing as well as it should or or what have you, that the experience is, is very seamless and that's the objective. We're joined by Ron Olson, Chief of Parks and Recreation for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, joining us on the Michigan Megacast. More information on everything happening in the Michigan DNR, including these infrastructure projects and other projects funded by the American Rescue Plan Act funds here in the state of Michigan can be found on michigan.gov slash DNR, michigan.gov slash DNR, and, and also, uh, Ron, there is, uh, there's been some proposed legislation or discussion about legislation that would make uh, residents of Michigan have preference in reservation of park resources uh, such as campsites. Can you give us your opinion on that or uh, uh, yeah, your opinion on, on that proposed legislation that would ultimately give Michiganders the first right to uh, check out and reserve areas of their parks here in the Great Lakes State. Well, one thing that to keep in mind is that uh, like 88% of the people that camp and lodge in state parks are residents of the state. Uh, and so some of the parks that people quest to get into like Ludington and Grand Haven and a few places like that that are very I'll call competitive to want to get in, they probably won't, even if that were done, probably wouldn't see much difference because the the residents of the state clearly are the higher majority of that. Um, we're trying to, obviously, to keep balance and encourage tourism and so forth. We'll have to see how it all plays out, but you know, it, it would provide a benefit for some, but uh, the reality of it is, is that due to the proportions, there probably won't, wouldn't be that much of an impact for the for the general person reserving um, the camp sites or cabins or what have you. 
So what you're saying is that if this is if that is the case, and su such a vast majority of people that are reserving areas in these parks are Michiganders themselves, then uh, is there even any point in this being in this proposed legislation going through and making that the the rule here in the state of Michigan? If it's not going to be of any really real benefit, then what's the point? Well, I guess there's some people believe that that will help and i'm not saying it wouldn't because there's always a chance that it would make a difference because we've this has been in place for for as long as i've been here and and since the uh reservation system's been put into place and it seems to work very fairly for everybody to that extent but yeah like i said some of the areas that people get uh, understandably frustrated about to get into um, those will probably remain because it, unless you're right on there when the six month window rolls around or in a case of a cabin that one year out you uh, oftentimes the campsites get get booked up very quickly in that first few hours of when the six month window opens uh, so that's that's the reality of it so I'm, I'm because we haven't done it before we don't know completely for sure but I'm just saying the statistics are in the in the side of the probability of it making a big difference is probably a, would be a small uh, smaller impact than some might think we're joined by Ron Olson the chief of parks and recreation for Michigan's Department of Natural Resources more information can be found on everything happening through the DNR at michigan.gov slash DNR michigan.gov slash DNR and uh, Ron two more minutes with you and I want to give you a chance to, to speak on this we've seen reports across many of the Great Lakes and, and even inland lakes over the past several weeks including uh, over, over the summer at some of Michigan's uh, beloved parks on the water. Incidents of people either running into hazards in the water or even being in situations where people have drowned in the water because uh, they may have, maybe are not following safety protocols to a tier or not taking the proper precautions as they go out on Michigan's waters. And of course, we want people to get out on the water in the state of Michigan. It's what brings people here. It's what people in the state love uh, about the summer here in Michigan. But what are some of those uh, critical safety issues or those critical safety precautions that maybe aren't being as follow followed as carefully as they probably should be by Michiganders and visitors that the DNR would like uh, visitors and Michiganders uh, going to our parks to keep in mind as we continue through this summer? Well, I think that that again, at our big beaches and the uh, the along the Great Lakes, particularly Lake Michigan, uh, that we do have and had adopted a long time ago the red, uh, yellow, and green scenario, uh, the virtual stoplight on reminders of the conditions when you come to a, uh, one of the parks, and they do vary from park to park. Some might wonder because of the wind direction and like Grand Haven and Holland, we have the uh, navigational structures that were created by the Army Corps of Engineers that does create a different turbulence sometimes depending on the way the wind blows and so we want people to be pay attention to the guidelines when in doubt wear a life jacket uh if you never haven't been to a great lake beach before or, or haven't been there in a long time it's a hot day the water can be very cold and it's always good to take extra precautions and to uh under inflate your expectation meaning that you know try to be careful and slowly uh enter into the water and things like that but be mindful of those flags because when the red flags fly they're flying for a reason it's because either rip currents are apparent or they're the waves are getting large and we now have instituted a we now have a new rule that was instituted this year where we have a we'll have a double flag uh, flying, which means that for temporarily you're prohibited from entering the water. And that's in cases of either contaminated water, debris in the water, or severe uh, waves, meaning that waves, you know, getting up to nearly eight feet tall, or if there's presence of rip currents or other dangers that may not appear to be the case. So, um, and that's helped a lot. We 
we really accelerated our public education. At some of the beaches, we have loudspeakers, but big signs when you come in. So when the red flags are up, even yellow, to heed the warning, but we would just say, when in doubt, wear a life jacket. If you have smaller kids, put a life jacket on them, and then you have peace of mind. And and because these are natural resources, and that even in a designated swim area, that. Um, but in the areas particularly not, and people should not be swimming or diving or uh, the break walls, that's prohibited, but people do that or get into peril uh, in that regard too. So, and also if somebody's on a paddleboard or a kayak, to be mindful of your capacity and make sure you have the proper life uh, uh, jackets and things so that, and don't over overdo your, your ability because these uh, lakes are can be formidable. Ron, we appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us today. All right, thank you. See you.